uh, viewers. So it's great to see so many AU colleagues in the po political theorists and beyond around the university, professors and grad students from around DC and the country, and even some colleagues from around the globe. So welcome to all of you. I want to give a special welcome, however, to um, our uh, AU undergraduates. Uh, it's a real testament to you that on a summer evening when you don't have to be here, you are. And uh, uh, especially to our alums, I saw the people who registered and uh, you are uh, an all-star team of our former students. Um, I'm really touched to see you here and, uh, and, and have you here. Uh, send me an email after the event and catch up. Did you want to acknowledge the students, Gordon? Yeah, uh, I'm really touched that there's so many students, uh, uh, so many of my old students uh, who've signed up, uh, who form a big contingent in the audience. And I just want to say thank you. It's great. In some ways, I feel like Jimmy Stewart at the end of It's a Wonderful Life, all these people coming back to see. So I'm, I'm really glad you're bored and uh, uh, have nothing else to do. So uh, I'm really touched <laughs> that you're coming on, so thanks. Well, so for, for all of you tuning in for our first live online event, I will tell you that our entire fall schedule is going to be live online. And, uh, and if there's this kind of demand, I think we'll be doing it forever. So, uh, so we look forward to maintaining relationships with all of you. In terms of our fall schedule, we've got five events uh, set up already. We're going to do a, a mini series on the future of, it's kind of related to the election in November, um, but sort of deeper, uh, more, uh, uh, more uh, deep philosophical currents of what's going on in the country. And so we're going to have three talks related to that. One on the future of socialism in the United States with Bhaskar Sankara. He is the editor of Jacobin magazine. One on the future of conservatism in the United States with Patrick Deneen of Notre Dame University and the author of the celebrated book, Why Liberalism Failed and one on the future of the center in the United States with Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution. We've got two other talks scheduled. The New York Times columnist, Rouse Douthit, is going to be giving our Lincoln Scholars Lecture. That will be sometime in October. And our first event of the fall will be on Constitution Day, September 17th. It's our annual Constitution Day lecture, and we'll be having Jonathan Marks of her Sinus College talking on free speech on campus. And so I don't know, but I've been told that there is a lot of pressure to conform on campus. And even though there's kind of technical free speech, there is a, a, a strong tyranny of the majority to uh, silence the uh, dissenter. So I think he'll be touching on that. Uh, but turning to today's event, just a few parameters. We're hope we're going to go for 90 minutes, so until seven o'clock. We're hoping to do it half conversation between Borden and myself, and then half Q and A from you all. Um, to ask questions, you're going to need to write it up and submit it v via the Q and A uh, function at the bottom of the the Zoom screen. I assume you're all familiar with that. Uh, when you submit the, your question, please include your name and affiliation. Um, and we hope that in the future, we'll have the ability for you to ask questions live uh, with your own voice and have uh, a little back and forth with uh, our speakers. It is the Political Theory Institute's custom, however, to allow students to ask the first question. So students, you can start thinking about that. I'll include alumni in, uh, in students for the sake of this. Um, so when, when you uh, send in your question, you say if you're from AU, say that you're a student or an alum and, and we'll uh, ask, get those questions in first. Uh, our speaker today, is my colleague and dear friend, Borden Flanagan. We've been poking and prodding each other, intellectually that is, for 20 years. Flanagan is an assistant professor in the Department of Government here at American University. 
He's writing a book on Pericles, political psychology, and the question of being in Thucydides. His paper from that project entitled Alcmeon's Islands, Motion and Rest in Thucydides, won the Midwestern Political Science Association slash Review of Politics Award for Best Paper in Normative Political Theory. Flanagan has published on Emerson and he teaches courses on ancient and modern political thought, Nietzsche, Machiavelli, Thucydides, and the love of glory. So it is my great pleasure, and to all of you who are still AU students, it can be your great pleasure, and I encourage you to look him up, to introduce uh, Borden Flanagan on the topic of Athens plague and ours. And so let's get started, Borden. I'm gonna just ask you sort of the, the big question here, the main, uh, uh, title, main point, your main thesis. What does Thucydides' account of and reflections on Athens' plague have to teach us about dealing with COVID-19 today? So it's a really rich passage. Uh, the, there are two main points I'll deliver now. One is just the necessity of confronting our mortality and assessing the meaning of our lives. Um, and that doing this seriously requires thinking about what that might mean according to nature. Uh, one of the things, besides the necessity of the question, uh, the passages about the plague and uh, the funeral oration which precedes it, gives us some interesting lessons about what it means to think about the, the, the meaning of our lives. Um, uh, you might say that there's a difference between big problems and deep problems. And uh, big problems, are how am I gonna put food on the table? Um, deep problems are what's the meaning of life? And the pandemic, of course, brings us face to face with both of those. Um, uh, we know about the big questions. Um, the deep questions uh, are an opportunity that we might miss if we don't realize that, that uh, those questions are. So, are so what you're saying, if I understand you correctly, is that plague situations or our pandemic is a kind of perverse opportunity to reflect on the meaning of life, what we're here for, what we're doing, that, that all the things that we're suffering, everyone at home bored out of their mind, uncertain about their future, unable to, to get things started, um, that this is an opportunity for all of us to be thinking about what is it what is it that we really want to be doing exactly it's an ever-present necessity but we don't always know that it's an ever-present necessity right. and it, the the pandemic brings us face to face with that so for example like a big question is how am i going to put food on the table uh it's you know 40 million americans out of work as a result of of this um the deep questions are uh do i believe in god uh i don't say that to subsume philosophical questions under theological ones, but just to give you an example of what maybe the two poles are. Answers to the big question can range, obviously, but in a different way. Whether you're a sanitation worker or, or a lawyer doesn't really affect, it will have a great big effect on the big questions of the circumstances of your life. It doesn't actually affect the meaning of your life. Um, th there's no necessary change in the meaning of your life, whether your income is 30,000 or 100,000. The question, do I believe in God, has a very great effect on what your life means to you. And I suppose if we could adopt a God's eye view, what your life means in the grand scheme of things. Um, but it's not going to bear necessarily on the, on the big question of, of how you're going to put food on the table. Um, but without Socrates to be a gadfly for us, at least we have the pandemic. That's right. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, I'll yeah. take Socrates. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, I mean, a, a Marxist would tend to say that the deep questions are just camouflage for the big questions. A priest would say that the big questions are distractions from the deep questions. And I'd say political philosophy occupies the, the broad territory between them. Um, so, yeah. Oh, okay. So the other lessons are all about political psychology, and those are very interesting indeed. Uh, Athenian society collapses completely under the pressure of the plague. And so we see interesting lessons about what keeps a society together by virtue of what tears a society apart. Um, 
we see the persistence of the question, these questions, these questions of meaning, and also the persistence of moral frameworks to think about them, even in the face of imminent death. Uh, and we learned something very interesting about how these questions of meaning relate to time. Time is a dimension that we don't necessarily think about philosophically. Um, uh, and it's, it's raised by, I mean, Thucydides brings it forward in interesting ways and uh, it's relevant to the, to the, to the meaning question. Um, so that's, that's the, the, uh, the payload. Okay, good. I, I hope we'll have a chance to cover all of those to kind of cycle through them. Yeah. Uh, but first, I know that in our audience, we have several uh, experts in Thucydides and uh, people who have read Thucydides. Um, but we also have probably a lot of students who have never heard of Thucydides, or if they've heard of him, they haven't read him. So let's just, on a, a very simple level first, can you just tell us a little bit, who is Thucydides? Uh, what's the book that he wrote? What, what did he do? A little bit about him. Yeah, uh, the best part is trying to get somebody who's never heard of Thucydides to pronounce his name. That's always <laughs> the party intro. Um, Thucydides. Th th uh, yeah, so he was a fifth century Athenian general. Uh, he was a man of politics. He fought on behalf of Athens. Um, but even before uh, he was sent off to fight, he knew that the war was going to be a, a great war. And in his uh, introductory remarks in the book, it makes clear that what he means by a great war is not just big, uh, because any big war can be superseded by a bigger war, but rather great in the sense of exposing the permanent features of human nature. So he says his book is going to be a, a, a useful possession for all time uh, by making clear what's permanent about uh, the human. He takes a, an adjective and turns it into a noun, the human. And he means roughly human nature. Um, and it doesn't take reading too far into the book to realize that what he means is that his account of the war is going to reveal the, the permanent features of, of human nature. And he's very crafty in, in how he does it. He, he juxtaposes events to, to put you in a position of having to make certain reflections. Um, and we're gonna, I hope, have time to look into that. So um, <clears throat> the-, the so uh, I, I remember when, when I was in, uh, in college, I had a, a seminar on this text, the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides, and 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 hearing all of these arguments, studying very carefully the arguments about um, why it's in human nature to have war and kind of inevitability of wars and the rise of interests and conflict, and leaving class one day and getting into my car and hearing the John Lennon song, "All We Are Asking Is Give Peace a Chance," and feeling a real sort of a, a gap between Thucydides and, and that sentiment. Yeah, so the great themes of the history are necessity and justice. And the Athenians justify their empire by saying that it's simply human necessity. Thucydides doesn't go so far as to, as to back that claim, but it's clear that human beings are given to tremendous error and folly and one of the things that, that appealed to me about Thucydides from the beginning is that he has, he's very humane, uh, but his, his humanity casts a, a sort of a light veil of sadness over the whole uh, narrative. He sees that human beings may not necessarily be compelled to war, but they're going to. They're, they're going to make grievous errors and they're going to be led into grievous errors by their own deep, irrational longings. And uh, it's possible for individuals to, to learn and to escape that, but it rarely happens. And so there's a kind of uh, fatherly sadness and understanding and concern that uh, illuminates. This isn't quite, uh, uh, you know, human life isn't comic for him, not quite. He's not quite platonic in that sense. Well, let, let's go back to what you, you mentioned a minute ago, about that the book is about the human things or the human. Mm -hmm. So let's turn to the plague and what does Thucydides' account of the plague 
have to teach us about the human things, human nature? Or why don't you just first start by, tell, tell us about the plague, what happened in Athens and all that. So the, uh, uh, the plague hits in the second year of the war. And the conditions are ripe for it. The Peloponnesians are raiding Athenian territory and, and most of the people in these ancient Greek cities lived in the suburbs. That's where the farming happened. And so a common uh, tactic of war was to go and burn people's farms. And so the Peloponnesians are doing this. Uh, Pericles brings everybody inside the city's walls. Uh, Athens is a naval empire, so they can get everything they need through the port. Uh, but you've got this overcrowding in the city as everybody's moved in from the countryside. Um, because they're a naval empire and get everything from trade, it means that they're exposed to uh, all the pathogens that, that are out uh, in the Mediterranean trading routes, and that's where it comes. Um, Thucydides is a very spooky plague. Uh, Thucydides first says it, it seems to have come from beyond Ethiopia, it's beyond the known world, but it hits in the port, it starts there, and then it, it spreads through the city like wildfire. And uh, the, the symptoms are, are hideous. Um, it starts in the head with an intense uh, fever and the eyes and uh, mouth and throat become uh, bloody and inflamed. It moves into an intense respiratory phase. Uh, uh, it then moves into the, to the stomach where people are, have uncontrolled vomiting of every bile uh, uh, recorded, he says. Uh, the skin opens up in, in bloody pustules. They feel an intense fever. It moves into the bowels finally, and they tend to die of ulcerative colitis. They, they, they're plagued by a, sorry, they're, they're seized by an intense restlessness and fever. They throw themselves into the public cisterns, the public water tanks, to try to cool themselves off, and they just burn themselves out. And uh, it kills them in a matter of days. And uh, the morbidity is shocking. So. We've, I mean, our, our pandemic is, is really bad. It's, and I don't mean to minimize it in any way. We've had 150,000 people die. It could double by the end of this. And then we're talking 300,000 people is one-tenth of 1% 1 of the population. And that's huge, that's awful. The plague in Athens killed between 25% and half of the, of the Athenian population. The, wow. most, the most frequent number I've seen cited is 30%. Uh, if you can imagine, one third of the entire population of the city of Athens died in the course of this year. Right. And, and uh, I mean, in the United States, that would be 107 million people. Yeah. I mean, imagine that. And so we can see how the, the society could just collapse. Right. And the is, we're, dealing, we're dealing with 150,000 dead, but the equivalent is 100 million dead. Right. At the end of it. Imagine this, right? A hundred million people dead. Uh, what, what that would be like. I mean, that's, that's unf unfathomable. Yeah. Everybody loses many, many family members. Um, the, so the effect on, on behavior is enormous. Uh, the three pillars of the Greek polis were law, kinship, and piety. Um, say, say that again. The, the three pillars of traditional Greek society. Of the Greek polis were, were law, kinship, and uh, um, what was the third? Piety. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, those were considered to be the things that kept things together. So we need law and order. We need, you know, family values, people sticking uh -huh. by their family, uh -huh. people being loyal to their kin, and, uh, and piety, religious observance. Um, because if we propitiate the gods, the gods will protect us. And all three of those fail immediately under the pressure of the plague. Uh, they're obliterated. Um, one of the most important duties to kin and to the gods was uh, burial. So if a family member died, you burn them on a funeral pyre and you bury the ashes. And this is uh, an important rite. Um, it's a matter of law as well. And people are dying in such numbers and so rapidly that their family members are too exhausted. And so if you can imagine this, that so many people are dying, that you have people fleeing their families because they don't want to get sick, yeah. or taking their dead family members and casting them where they can, sometimes on top of somebody else's 
already burning funeral pyre. It's, uh, it's gruesome. It's like something out of Hieronymus Bosch. Um, so and, so th this is, I mean, probably a lot of families in this country have had the conversation with themselves. If somebody got COVID and they thought it was um, contagious, right, they would self-isolate within the house or something and other people wouldn't go into that room to the extent possible. Um, but, but here, in the case of Athens, one third of the society is dying and or is dead at the end. And uh, how, what percent of people who get it die? Uh, it's not, I mean, there's no public health infrastructure yeah. of any kind, so they don't know. Um, and there aren't even hospitals. Uh, if you got sick, and uh, you know, you had a little money. You could have a doctor come in. Um, the doc, the the medical arts, were um, you know maybe better than medieval Europe, but not very good. <laughs> yeah, uh, not very But it good. raises the question of a sort of like what you what would you do, right? Yeah. If one of your family members got the plague, and it was a high chance that they're going to die, and if you interacted with them, you would die too. Right. Yeah. So what would you do with them while they were alive and then while they were dead and you're saying they just threw them on someone else's burning funeral pyres to burn the body. It would be like us taking your dead to the cemetery and instead of having a hole dug for the dead for, for your loved one, there'd be a hole dug for someone else and you just throw their body into that hole and head home. Right. Exactly. And leave them. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, imagine the, uh, the sorrow and the and the exhaustion. I mean, that's that's the that's the scene. Um, and so, um, so you said there were three there were three pillars that were the breakdown. This is one, right? The family part is that the key aspect of the family breakdown, or is there more just, to that? So it's an example of it. Uh, uh, Thucydides focuses more on on uh, piety and, and law. Okay. Um, uh, but the funeral pyre business uh, is all three. Um, it's illegal to, you know, to dump your body in somebody else's funeral pyre. Uh, it's a violation of, of uh, the divine right, uh, rights of, of uh, you know, dealing with the body. Um, and obviously it's, it's a betrayal of the, of the family, um, of the obligation of the family. Yeah. Um, he, he says that people just abandon their, their families to, to get away from the plague. Um, so he talked, so I want to read this passage uh, because uh, it's section 53. Um, if you, uh, Mackenzie, if you could put this up on the screen, this details the social collapse uh, of the play. I don't know if I have to stop my video. Do I have to stop my video? Mackenzie, could you uh, put it on the screen? Yes, yeah, so I'm getting right now. Okay, do I need to? No. Okay, so smooth. <laughs> we're, we're pros here. That's just I our first that. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're rookies. Yes. We're rookies, exactly. We'll be smooth soon enough. This feels like uh, broadcast news. There we go, do you see it? Yes. Yep, okay. If you could, our uh, pictures are over the English. I don't know yeah. if you can slide it in a way. Um, one second. What about now? Pictures are still there. Uh, a little better, but there we go. All right. Great. Okay, great. Okay. So I'm starting um, at uh, you know, where it says L I I I. That's uh, 53, that's second, there we go, excellent. Okay. In other respects, also the plague first introduced into the city a greater lawlessness. For where men hitherto practiced concealment that they were not acting purely after their pleasure, they now showed a more careless daring. They saw how sudden was the change of fortune in the case both of those who were prosperous and suddenly died and of those who before had nothing, but in a moment were in possession of the property of the others. 
and so that so that's you know people are dying and then uh the poor come in and uh take over the houses um and so they resolved to get out of life the pleasures which could be had speedily and would satisfy their lusts regarding their bodies and their wealth alike as transitory and no one was eager to practice self-denial in prospect of what was esteemed honor because everyone thought that it was doubtful whether he would live to attain it but the pleasure of the moment and whatever was in any way conducive to it came to be regarded as at once honorable and expedient no fear of gods or law of men restrained for on one hand seeing that all men were perishing alike they judged that piety and impiety came to the same thing and on the other no one had expected uh, he would live to be called to account and pay the penalty of his misdeeds. On the contrary, they believed that the penalty already decreed against them and now hanging over their heads was a far heavier one, and that before this fell, it was only reasonable to get some enjoyment out of life. So uh, I want to look at uh, three things there. Uh, there's a pattern. Um, what was formerly honored is cast aside, but the principle of honoring sticks around. So nobody cares about the law anymore. And it's really interesting, uh, why? Why don't they care about the law? Because they don't expect to live to come to trial. So they don't mind breaking the law because they're gonna be dead by the time the, you know, the constable comes for them. Um, and this tells us something very interesting. It's not just that the, you know, to use modern language, it's not just that the state needs a monopoly on violence. The state also needs a monopoly on hope for the body. On what? Hope for the body. Uh huh. So if, if you're not gonna live, you're not gonna fear punishment. So if, if the community can't guarantee the safety of the body such that people will fear for it, then punishment loses its teeth. The, the, the community, the politics becomes invisible. Um, uh, and so this is a very postmodern point about the importance of the body and politics about control of the body and that the state, the state can only succeed if it can control the body enough to punish it later. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the fact that, that everybody's going to die also means that the, the, the timeline, the time horizon has become so shortened that no collective action is possible. So another thing he says is that uh, people didn't care about honor because there was no way to achieve it. Uh, people are gonna die before they're able to, to win a victory in battle. Um, and so uh, society needs some kind of time horizon that it can guarantee. And that means preserving the body. Um, uh, interestingly enough, they don't stop caring about justice. Uh, they justify their actions. They decide that, well, we might as well be criminal and get what we can because the sentence against us has already been decreed. Now, what they mean is not a political sentence. They don't think that, that the leaders of Athens have sent this plague. They think it's a divine sentence that's been passed against them. And that's what I want to uh, get to next. But, uh, their criminality is not something that they simply view in amoral terms. They think they're, they're justified. It's reasonable uh, that they do it. The, in the Greek, the word is akos. Uh, uh, it's only reasonable that they, that they get what they can. Um, akos means uh, in the normal course of things. And it often has sort of a transactional meaning. You, you give me this, I give you that. Um, and do, the people, do the people think that it was somehow just that the gods were punishing them and they deserved it or that it was unjust. And so if they were going to be punished anyway, well, they might as well do something that deserved it. I think it's the latter. I mean, I'll, I'll move to, to piety in a second, but they, they don't seem to think that there's a reasonable expl explanation for this. Now, later they blame Pericles uh, uh, because they think, oh, it's, it, he got us into this war and the gods are punishing us uh, for, this, for this war. But at this point, Thucydides doesn't uh, uh, articulate on their behalf any sense that, that, ah, this is why it's happening. Okay, 
uh, we're, we're being punished for this or that sin. Instead, what he seems to be saying is that, well, we're being condemned anyway. We might as well do something to deserve it. Uh, uh, there, there's a sense here that they're, they're actually balancing the scales of justice by a kind of uh, restorative criminality. Um, <laughs> When, whenever, I, whenever I teach this, I ask my students, have your parents ever punished you for something that you didn't do? And then you figured, well, I'm getting punished for it. I might as well do it. Uh, and my students never say yes. <laughs> oh, my five-year-old does that all the time, yeah. quite explicitly. <laughs> right. right, right. Well, so, but this is very interesting, right? Because um, they, politics is invisible, but they still care about justice. They, they still think that... Um, uh, maybe they can create some kind of meaning or coherence out of this chaos by writing the scales. Um, and then with piety, it, it's a similar kind of thing. So that's the third point. So it's kinship, that was the law, and now piety. Well, we already did kinship. This was, this yeah. was the law. The third yeah, I'm point. just reviewing. We've, did, we've right. done the first two, and now we're going on to the third of the three pillars of Greek society. Right. Okay. There's, a, there's another third that I'm going to bring in. But yeah, so, so with piety, it's very interesting because they, uh, they stop propitiating the gods because it's not going to do any good. The impious are dying alongside the pious. Um, so why bother? But they still believe in the gods. They, they, there's this cataclysmic event which strikes down the pious and the impious alike. And instead of responding by thinking, well, I guess there are no gods, they still believe that there are gods. They just believe that they're implacable and mysterious. Um, and that's very interesting. They would, they would prefer to believe that the gods are implacable and mysterious and you know, dead set against them than believe that there are no gods. Divine hostility is preferable to you know, indifferent nature, meaninglessness. You know, as Nietzsche says, gravity, the stone, fate, you know, the nothing. Um, Believing that there are gods makes it somehow uh, uh, meaningful or coherent. Uh, it, it sort of heals the abyss of meaning opened up by the, the, the chaos of, of the plague. You know, okay, mysterious gods. I guess that makes sense. Um, and, and another part of this also, I think that if you believe that there are mysterious and implacable gods, uh, uh, punishing you for no reason that you can think justified, at least there's somebody watching you. At least there's some audience to your suffering and, and death. Uh, otherwise, if it's simply in different nature, then you slip out of existence into oblivion and there's no trace of you behind. If, if there's an immortal being watching you, well, maybe some memory of you will, will persist beyond the grave. Yeah. Um, this, this plays off actually the funeral oration, which I hope we, we get to, because there Pericles talks about glory as a way to you know, become somewhat immortal in the sense of being remembered after death. Here it's you know, maybe the divine witness of, of your suffering that lives, lives beyond you. So law, forget about it, but justice remains piety, propitiating, you know, going, doing the, the, the pious things, that drops away, but religious belief still persists. Um, and at the beginning, you, you mentioned a, a point on time and the, the importance of time or that people's lives were in the shrunken time frame. And, and that's what underlies all of these changes. Do you, is this a good point to talk about that? So I just want to say something about uh, the noble because that's okay. the other thing that, that persists here. So nobody persists in noble action. Uh, a civic devotion becomes pointless because we're gonna die before we can accomplish uh, anything. But they still believe that in, they still hold the frame of assessing whether things are noble. So one of the more interesting clauses here is that they continued to, that, that they viewed pleasure taking as both honorable and useful, as both noble and useful. And there's an interesting parallel there. So the traditional view and, and the view that, that Pericles articulates right before this plague hits is that nobility is self-sacrifice uh, on behalf of the city. So you overcome your fear of death 
uh, to go out and fight the enemy. Um, noble, you know, what's morally admirable uh, in the context of the plague is you overcome your reverence for the old customs and norms for the sake of uh, defying death by a kind of desperate hedonism. So it, that teaches us something that when people try to construct some kind of meaning in their lives, they still think in these moral terms, they still uh, uh, assess things in terms of whether or not they're morally admirable. But the noble, as Socrates might talk about it, seems here in Thucydides to consist of some kind of self-overcoming, some kind of declaration of internal freedom. I'm not gonna knuckle under. I'm gonna be free of, of this constraint, whether it's fear of death or reverence for the, for the old norms. Uh, and the other aspect of it is, is some kind of defiance, uh, defiance of death uh, in the case of, of you know, normal politics or the imperial politics of Athens. Uh, and again, kind of defiance of death in the face of, of the plague. Um, and just the, the upshot is that if this is a deep element of human political psychology, then the community needs to be able to have this on its side. That the, the need for defiance and some kind of expression of dignity and uh, internal freedom uh, is a, a plank of political psychology that we need to pay attention to, or else it's, it's gonna be turned against society as, as easily it can be used uh, to support it. So these are deep longings that can be pro-social, but they don't need to be pro-social. They can be anti-social. Uh -huh. And we, we see that today with people being defiant and insisting on sort of following their own sense, right? Well, I mean, it can, it can be, you know, it can take, it can take uh, you know, many different forms. Um, you know, I mean, the, 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 the protests and, and the riots that, that followed them, I think were clearly conditioned by everybody being bottled up by the pandemic. And I think a part of that was a kind of an insistence uh, on, uh, you know, defying what they regard as an unjust order and not, not being um, given an opportunity uh, 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 for dignity. I think that was, that was part of it. Um, so, you know, these are, these are um, uh, important motives that can be fuel to, to warm the house or burn it down. Okay, so let me, Mackenzie, can you take down the uh, passage now and just restore yeah. Borden and I? Uh, and, and Borden, so we, we, there's a couple of things that have come up. We have about 15 minutes left in our conversation before we begin Q&A. And so okay. there's been the thing about time and, yeah. and, and, you've, talked about, and you've referred to the, funer the funeral oration a couple of times. How, which would you like to go to now? So uh, just I'll say something very quick about time and then and and our situation and then we'll go back and and uh, buttress it with uh, the funeral oration. So the bit about time is is just that uh, the the we tend to think about the meaning of our lives in terms of our purposes, and uh, those purposes are informed by uh, the 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 community that we're in. The community gives us in many ways, purposes for us. And any purpose is a temporal thing. It's something that's out in our future. And when the, uh, the time horizon is radically shortened under the plague, it radically alters the, the, the meaning that the Athenians uh, understand uh, uh, in their lives. And um, so you can think of meaning as being experienced temporally. Sure. We understand our lives in terms of some project that takes place. And human beings, there, in a way, there is no present for human beings because the present is so thoroughly invested with our thoughts about the future. Um, uh, so if we experience time, if, sorry, if we experience meaning temporally in this way, um, that helps to understand this particular moment that, that we're in now. If our futures are cut off, that's going to make us question what our lives mean anymore. And that's certainly what happens to the Athenians. What does life mean if, if everything I thought my life was about is simply forestalled? Um, with us, with the, the pandemic, um, you know, those of us who aren't in imminent danger, nevertheless, are suspended from our futures as a result of, of all of this. It's, it's uncertain exactly what's, what's gonna happen. And the interesting thing about this that I've observed is that it's not simply a matter of 
what do I put on my calendar? It's not just a matter of time management. There are all kinds of practical consequences from it, but the, the discomfort goes beyond uh, time management. Um, sort of, there's a looming sense of existential disorientation where people are, are wondering, what's my life mean now? Um, I think that's the way that the, that the Athenian plague is most relevant to our situation. We're not dropping like flies, but we're, we're left wondering. Existential words like angst and ennui have a new kind of right. relevance. We're not just bored and anxious. We're wondering, what's, what's, what's my life about now? Yeah, so I, I think we probably both had a lot of students who are in a hurry to graduate, a hurry to, to go to law school or something, and <laughs> to get the next job, and but for what? And you ask them why they want to do it, and they don't really have an answer or no or no why. And but yet there's we we spend a lot of time sacrificing the present for the sake of some hope for a gain in the future, and and. But if you knew that you were going to die two weeks from now, or a month from now, or a year from now, would you do? Would you go to law school? Would you write that extra brief? Would you stay at the office till twelve o'clock finishing the brief, or what would you do? Would you travel? Well, today you can't travel, but would you spend time with your family? Would you read? Would you try to commune with God? What What is it? that you would do if you knew that your time was really finite. And in fact, all of our time is really finite. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, Hannah and her sisters, that Woody Allen movie where Woody Allen thinks he has cancer and he, the, the doc tells him that it's imaginary and he comes out of the appointment and he jumps for joy. He's not gonna die. And he runs down the sidewalk and then he stops because he realizes he's gonna die anyway. And he yeah. spends the rest of the, the, the movie looking at different uh, religions to try to figure things out. But uh, yeah, I mean, most of us uh, are, are not necessarily really faced with fear of death, but the uncertainty about the future brings the question of meaning forward uh, uh, in a way that it necessarily wouldn't. So that's why, what I meant at the beginning, that it's a, it's a real opportunity. Um, now, if we're gonna think about that, we don't start from nowhere, we all begin someplace. Uh, our, our political community uh, gives us a, a view um, and we need to interrogate that. And the, the, so one of the ways that Thucydides gets us to think about things is through juxtaposition. And the speech, there's a, a famous, maybe the most famous speech in history is Pericles' funeral oration. Um, and it, it just precedes the plague. And it's a very lofty speech it's all about uh, uh, virtue and, and uh, honor. And so the contrast with the hideous suffering of the plague is, is uh, pretty great. Um, but this- So when you say we, we all start from somewhere, uh, do you mean that when we try to figure out how we live our lives and the meaning in our lives, we live in societies that supply us with answers, right? Like in Plato's cave, all of you have had, have studied, <laughs> Plato's Republic with us, and you know what the cave is, right? That the thing that supplies the meaning that's not really true, but is what society says is true and gets people to uh, bend accordingly. So is this what you're suggesting that the, the Pericles funeral oration is sort of like uh, Thucydides account of, of the cave of Athens, of what they believe in, how they see themselves? Exactly, exactly. Um, this is... Uh, uh, I find this connection to be really exciting. It just occurred to me, I don't know why it hadn't occurred to me before, but one thing that makes the funeral oration really amazing is that he gives a comprehensive account of the human good. Um, and it's a, it's a perfect example of a cave. Um, it gives an account of uh, uh, how the individual's interests are reconciled to the common good. In a way, that's the question of political philosophy. How do you reconcile the individual and the common good? Um, and in doing so, he gives an account uh, of uh, what's best for human beings. He gives an account of moral evaluation. Every cave gives a version of good, bad, noble, base, uh, just, unjust, divine, human. And the funeral oration does all of that, except for the divine. Nature replaces the divine, which makes it amazing in another way as well. So it's, it's, a, um, it's an articulation of 
what it means to be an Athenian, what Athens means. It's a cave in that regard. Um, it's also amazingly, amazingly proto-philosophic um, because most, well, let me set the scene uh, briefly. Every year, particularly in time of war, the Athenians would have a, a, a funeral gathering. So everybody who died uh, in the war uh, would be burned on a pyre, their, their ashes would be brought, uh, and, and uh, somebody would make a speech over them. The, the, the relatives would give their ululations, their wailing uh, uh, over the dead. Um, kind and, of like a national Gettysburg address. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the Gettysburg, perfect. The Gettysburg address is another example because Lincoln gives brilliantly this account of what it means to be an American. And that's why it, it's such a deep speech. Um, now, on this occasion, the speaker has a pretty tough task because the speaker has to justify sacrifice for the city. He has to somehow reconcile individual good with the common good in the context in which that's really hard because that means dying in war. So how do you do that? Most of the time, speakers do that by uh, appeals to sentiment, uh, uh, love of family, defending the gods of the city, defending the altars. Um, it's generally a, a sentimental appeal. Pericles' speech is different. He doesn't do that. Instead, he gives uh, a a, I mean, whether it's sound or not is another uh, matter, but he gives a kind of a rational account of why the individual human good really, really is maximized by service for the city and even dying for the city. And, that's, and, and in the service of that, um, he gives an account of human virtue and his account of human virtue is explicitly according to nature. It's, he doesn't want to uh, be vulnerable to the charge of the sophist, that he's just making it up, that this is just convention. He's, his speech is much more ambitious than that. He wants to give an account according to nature of why human excellence is fulfilled in uh, Athenian citizenship and devotion city. So um, that makes it uh, remarkable, but it also reveals powerful tensions within politics that, that may be just natural to politics. So he gives two versions of uh, how the individual and the common good are, are reconciled. One is by uh, virtue, that devotion to the city, that because the city is meritocratic, he says, and uh, it fights on the biggest stage um, and offers the highest rewards, uh, that it brings out natural human excellence in the Athenians. So devotion to the civic project uh, uh, accomplishes eudaimonia, accomplishes full human flourishing. Okay, the problem is you might die, in which case, where does your human flourishing go? So the other way that he offers is immortal glory. He makes this, this fantastical claim that every single individual who dies on behalf of the empire will be remembered forever. Um, and that's very interesting. Uh, in the first place, there's this great tension between those two because natural virtue, he says, involves overcoming fear of death. It's kind of natural overcoming of, of fear of death. Glory is an escape from death. It involves buying into a not really reasonable understanding of, of immortality. Um, this tension raises a very deep problem in the meaning of politics. Because if this is an expression of human nature, if Thucydides is, is right, that he's exposing something uh, true about human political psychology, then what it suggests is that politics, if Pericles is articulating a deep human longing here, then what it suggests is that politics is, it's as much about, f about transcending nature uh, uh, in a kind of impossible immortality. Um, as it is about fulfilling nature. So, I mean, we think about politics in terms of serving our interests. Uh, and, and we do that because the modern move in the history of political, philo political philosophy was to try to bury precisely this ambition that, that Pericles articulates, this, this impossible longing for glory. That leads to war, that leads to all kinds of, of destruction. Uh, 
this speech raises the possibility that there's something deep that can't be expunged that uh, the, which threatens the modern project. If, if Thucydides is right, then we may be papering over this very dangerous longing for transcendence and it, it's gonna pop out in, in, in dangerous ways. Um, so that's another thing that we have to think about. Uh, two things here uh, to, to bring it back. And then I wanna talk about time a little bit. Um, first of all, the funeral oration makes clear what our challenge is if we're going to think carefully and deeply about what our lives mean. Because there's, every society is a cave that gives us answers for what uh, uh, the meaning of life is, um, what a good and a bad life is, what a, a moral and an, and an unjust life is. Um, but it could be false. Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, Pericles raises this question. What are you gonna die for? And yeah, we're all gonna die. Every community wants to give you an answer for what you should die for. Uh, if you're gonna come up with a rational account, that means thinking about nature. What is the human good? What is human virtue according to nature? Because otherwise you're just stuck with something conventional uh, or maybe something that you, know, you pull out of the air yourself. But most likely if you're pulling something out of the air, it's just a, a, a corrupted version of something that's, that was in the air already. Um, so serious thinking about this uh, is the, the funeral oration kind of adumbrates or, or points towards what serious thought about uh, the human good is. We have to come up with some kind of understanding of nature. Um, and then the other part of that is uh, and I, 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 the, there's the political psychology part of, of these dark longings for transcendence. And if, we, if somebody wants to ask about that in the Q&A, we can talk about that further. But also, um, time comes back in because when we think about our timeline, our temporal project as individuals, every community frames that within some larger temporal project that is the communities. And that larger temporal project usually is anchored in some understanding of eternity, something beyond. Um, so I'll give you an example. In, in the case of Athens, the individual time frame of accomplishing excellence and accomplishing glory uh, is framed by the Athenian temporal project of limitless expansion. Uh, and that's framed within a kind of natural uh, uh, setting uh, by Pericles, uh, the drama of, of human virtue. Um, and he changes that later in his interesting. But um, manifest destiny frames individual striving within an understanding of uh, eternity and the divine plan um, divine right monarchy frames uh, individual projects in terms of Christian eschatology. Uh, um, uh, progressivism frames things in terms of the arc of, of history, uh, or the arc of history bends toward justice. Really? Uh, that's the, but that's the, maybe, but that's the larger framework that the community gives us to think about. Um, for communist nation, uh, the, the individual striving is, is placed within the framework of the historical dialectic and the project of accomplishing true socials. In all these cases, the community, the cave, gives us answers for what our lives mean in a temporal project that, uh, in which the community is a kind of mediator between the individual and some grander account of the total ambit of time within which the community has its destiny. The community is kind of a midway point, a mediator between the individual and the universe understood. So, so don't be a dupe of the cave, raise, th think through for yourself. Um, the Engage question of political needed, philosophy. And, and of political philosophy, right. And yeah. And you know, we, we've, I think we've gone on for our portion. Let me yeah. just ask what you one last question. Sure. Um, because, and, and then, so, so you people who at home uh, with your questions, you, please be sending those in now. Um, but you, insofar as Pericles wants to overcome nature, right? And that the city wants to over, give you answers to overcome your nature and have you die in the name of it. Um, well, 
it, there's a kind of analogy here to the modern project, which is to overcome nature. And obviously COVID-19 suggests that we have not successfully mastered nature and overcome it, or we wouldn't be having this problem with, uh, di with this disease. Um, but but is, it, what, is there a lesson for, I don't know, the modern project as such that comes out of Pericles' attempt to overcome nature? Yeah, so, um, uh, so there's a, it's a great question. Uh, it's a, a very deep question. Uh, I'll see if I can- 30 guess. seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, Pericles is kind of, uh, he offers a, a dual vision, but it's a contradiction. There's, uh, uh, and I think it's aimed at different audiences. People who really can face their mortality and be okay with it, can accept a project of uh, fulfilling nature. And, that's open, and that involves facing death and overcoming it. And I think that's ultimately the challenge. But for most people, we quail at the idea of, of death. And so we wanna kind of, we wanna launch beyond nature uh, and that gives rise to, uh, 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 you know, projects of glory. And, and so there's a certain, there's a, a possibility that the, that the plague is actually meant by Thucydides as a metaphor for human ambition. And so this is the big enemy in the Leviathan. Uh, Hobbes wants to scare us out of desire for glory and he minimizes it. Uh, one of the most interesting, and I think not sufficiently treated elements of Locke is the way he deals with ambition and desire for glory. He wants to use it on behalf of liberty, but he also wants to kind of uh, 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 submerge it. So there's this question, to what extent has modernity in focusing on, focus, focusing on nice, safe, homely activities, right? Prosperity, peace, these are great things to, to, to focus on. But is there some languishing, explosive urge for something beyond? Modernity seems to, uh, uh, a friend of mine, Abe Shulsky, uh, wrote a great piece on how liberalism seems to generate uh, its own uh, opposition because there's something in human nature that can't quite rest with uh, prosperity and, and safety. And so there's uh, Islamism, uh, kind of, uh, renewed interest in, uh, in a communist statism, uh, the theocratic movements of various kinds. Um, it's an open question. Uh, maybe the, pro the project of liberalism may be right. That may be the best solution, but it may not be, it may be a solution that, that is condemned to eternal battle because there's something in the human soul that, that, won't, that won't rest. Right. Uh, so, so we want more and, and trying to have more, without more, we're unsatisfied and trying to get more can lead to disaster. Yeah. It's a fine line uh, in the search for meaning. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, difficult. There's also, uh, uh, just very quickly, the way Thucydides describes the plague is very spooky. And it suggests that the plague is, a, is possibly a, that the plague may demonstrate a latent potential in nature itself for uh, explosive chaos. Um, and that raises this question of, of nature that may be true. So when we look at viral uh, evolution, has modernity actually conquered viral evolution? Clearly not. Um, and some of the responses to COVID have been, to what extent has modernity actually set the stage for this? To what extent has uh, increased population, um, uh, uh, modern agriculture and, and farming practices, um, uh, you know, animal farming of various kinds, uh, you know, possibly climate change, to what extent have human factors actually accelerated uh, viral, uh, viral evolution? So to what extent is the, is the larger project of conquest for nature, setting the stage for some natural explosion. I, th I think three weeks ago, a more contagious version of H1N1 was discovered and H1N1 is much deadlier than, than COVID. So it's, these are spooky possibilities that are still with us and they, and they do 
give us an opportunity to reflect on uh, the modern project. Uh, you know, nobody wants to abandon it, but what if, you know, what if the dragon hasn't been slain? slain. What if what? What if the dragon hasn't been slain? Uh -huh. Slain? Yeah. Slayed? Dislayed. Um, yeah. So yeah, but it's 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 a real tightrope because on the one on the one hand, you've got the point about urging, uh, taking advantage of the horrible situation to reflect on the meaning of your life in order to live a better life now, right? With some urgency, and on the other hand, attempts to do too much, muck up nature, and and come back and hurt us. Yeah, well, they're, they're different things, right? Uh, I mean, there's the, the, the project of, of thinking seriously. That's more in line with, you know, reconciling ourselves to nature. The question is, what happens when we don't really take that seriously? What if we try to deny our mortality and seek some kind of crazy transcendence in, instead? You know, and it, I mean, it, it could be, it could take the form of, resurgence of political romanticism. It could take the form of some kind of creepy, uh, you know, private sector dystopia of the transhumanist sort. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of, of ways that, that uh, this explosive uh, desire for transcendence can, uh, can emerge. Um, the, the alternative posed by Thucydides himself is uh, political philosophy. Confronting okay. the question. So, Borden, we have a lot of questions. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to I'm going to jump in, and uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, start reading them. We have a question from an AU alum, Ben Manjafrida, hey. from, uh, uh, graduate of sixteen, and he says in parentheses, "Professor Flanagan taught the hardest class I took while at AU." I resent that, Ben. <laughs> uh, on Thucydides, but has struck a long-running wrestling match with the text, which I've really enjoyed. My question is. The plague of Athens caused complete suffering and the collapse of Athenian society. Well, COVID has had awful impacts on some parts of society, but has increased the net worth of Jeff Bezos and others by huge amounts. Do you think that this is a sign that America will emerge better or worse than Athens in the wake of its plague? Oh, well, I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's a pretty easy question to answer better. I mean, better because the plague isn't as bad better because, uh, you know, whatever you think of, mm -hmm. of uh, capitalism, um, it's been mm -hmm. amazing the kind of resources that have been directed to uh, uh, accomplishing a vaccine. And, uh, you know, we're, it, I'm amazed that we already have not just one, but several vaccines that are, that are in, the, in the testing phase. Um, the, sort of the larger question about you know, modernity in nature is, right now we're still, I mean, what modernity has accomplished is astonishing. I guess the question is, are we gonna lose the game of whack-a-mole? Um, uh, in terms of the enrichment of, of Bezos and the rest, I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, I don't think it's Bezos's enrichment that has impoverished anybody else. Uh, I mean, whatever you think about, uh, I mean, obviously there's an issue of, of inequality where the people at the top uh, get a whole lot richer. Um, it's not clear that the people at the bottom get poorer. Uh, that doesn't vitiate the, the, the problem um, at all. Um, but it's a different, it's a different kind of, of problem. And at this point, um, you know, I, it's hard to be too critical of big pharma when, uh, when they're coming up with, with Cures. And I'm, this doesn't mean I'm a fan of, of big pharma. Um, I think there are a whole host of issues that, that are uh, raised by you know, economic inequality and, and how capitalism works. But I'm not sure that, that um, and obviously the plague highlights, sorry, the, the, the pandemic highlights those. People at the bottom are, are much worse off. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not comfortable professors who got tossed out of work. Um, it's generally people in, in the, the lower third that got bounced out of work and they're in, they're in a, a terrible situation. Um, mm -hmm. 
But compared to Athens, yeah, we're better off. But, okay. but I also don't think that, that uh, I mean, if, the reason I'm, I'm a little bit thrown is I'm not sure that the pandemic is going to, while it highlights those issues, you know, how's the bottom third gonna, gonna manage? Um, it's, uh, I, I don't think it gives us uh, uh, a clear way out or, or necessarily change the terms in which we address those problems. The next question is from Gabriella Folsom, who graduated this past May. Yeah. And her question is, from your perspective, is COVID-19 compromising our pillars of society in a similar way to the Athenian plague? If so, what are the pillars of our society that are especially vulnerable to this kind of event? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, yeah, I wish I asked that question. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. No, Gabriel is so good. Uh, I just don't think I have an answer because it requires, uh, uh, I mean, what do I think the pillars of our society are? I mean, uh, I think the pillars of our society are uh, our rights uh, as, uh, as guaranteed under the Constitution. Um, and to the extent that Social unrest. I mean, you know, there's so many pre-existing problems that that uh, the pandemic just just highlighted. Uh, you know that we've all seen. Um, but I don't think the pandemic uh, has made those problems worse. So I mean, take an example. You know, racism. Pandemic didn't make the racism worse. Uh, it probably made the protests against it uh, uh, more volatile. Um, uh, does that mean that uh, they're going to be, and that may actually end up undercutting the effect of, of those protests? Um, uh, you know, we'll have to see whether there's a backlash uh, that, that's coming or not. Um, uh, so there may be follow on effects. Um, but it's, it's not exactly that people are going to, that because of the pandemic, people are going to um, abandon the Constitution. I don't think. Uh, yeah, I mean, for example, uh, you know, so, uh, I mean, since this is an opportunity to editorialize, I'm going to keep it minimal. I'm not a fan of this president, but I also never thought that he was going to be any kind of dictator. Uh, he wants to be on TV, and you know he's not a he's not a, a a dictator. And so he had an opportunity when all this hit to gather into himself tremendous uh, powers. I mean, he could have declared an emergency and and really been out there mm -hmm. in terms of, of state power, um, and he hasn't. Uh, uh, he's, he's, um, so I don't think that that's, uh, that's, that's one way that, that a pandemic such as ours, such as ours could really lead to, uh, uh, damage to, to our pillars. Right? Our pillars are the, are the Constitution and the Declaration. And I don't see a uh, danger to those. In terms of family, um, uh, I mean, one of the lessons of Thucydides is that the things that we think are pillars aren't really pillars. Family, we think of that as a pillar, but maybe that's just a pillar in sort of medium range disasters, not really, really big disasters. Uh, I think that family is certainly a pillar in dealing with, with COVID. Uh, uh, and one of the most heartbreaking aspects of, of the pandemic has been the way it's isolated family members from each other and you know, people not able to say goodbye to their dying relatives and it's horrible. Um, but I don't think the pandemic uh, sort of has damaged the family. Um, uh, I guess I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, great. Uh, question from Harry Kazanoff, an hey. alum. And he says, hello, I was wondering, how do you imagine the plague you would have affected the Spartans? <laughs> on one hand, it seems as though yeah. the plague capitalized on the more individualistic Athenian society. But I'm wondering if you think the Spartan model would have overcome the plague intact or fair even worse with a complete societal breakdown so this is a really good question for for covid today right you have the more individualistic west versus more 
uh, communal or uh, uh, authoritarian societies, right? And who's going to come out better? So the Spartans versus Athens, U.S. versus China and, for, and Russia. What do you have? Right. Well, so, right, Spartans. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Asian countries seem to have done better because they've had experience, you know, with SARS. And so, you know, mask culture I've read about, uh, they're more on board with mask culture. They're, they're, uh, it's, it's uh, they, for various reasons, getting everybody to do the same thing uh, in a sort of social hygiene program uh, has been better in, in certain Asian countries. Uh, for Sparta, I mean, I just think of them all sort of keeling over in the phalanx. You know, uh, it's not clear that that uh, social cohesion always helps when it when it comes to a, a, a pandemic. But it is interesting that it doesn't hit the the plague uh, that hit the ancient world did not hit the Peloponnese. Um, now, in the narrative, in the book, um, another thing that's parallel to the plague is this amazing. Thucydides gives this amazing account of a civil war uh, at Corsaira, and that's really worth looking at too, because that's another example of social collapse. And that only hit the democracies. That didn't hit the oligarchies. That didn't hit uh, uh, places like Sparta. Uh, uh, Sparta. Sparta didn't so much win the war as Sparta didn't lose the war. And the reason it didn't lose the war is because of its emphasis on, on social cohesion. Um, so I guess my point is that in, in some respects, uh, a society that's that's more communitarian and, and sort of disciplinarian and, and used to uh, uh, uniform, I guess, it's easier to get people to cooper cooperate uh, in some kind of mass program. That can be really useful when it comes to uh, uh, public health policies to, to forestall a, a pandemic. Uh, Spartans wouldn't have done that. They just would have, you know, sat around in their barracks and died. Uh, but um, when it comes to the uh, vulnerability to political instability. Uh, that's kind of an ongoing uh, debate in the history of political thought. Um, are democracies more supple, uh, maybe more given to, you know, medium range volatil volatility, but less given to, to total breakdown than more rich societies? Um, hard to say. Um, so I think the Spartans, if they had actually the Spartans would have been worse off if the plague had actually hit there. The, the question is, does the fact, is, does Thucydides use the fact that the plague doesn't hit the Peloponnese, is that meant to be a political metaphor for uh, uh, democratic instability? So I'll leave that there. Okay, We've, we have several questions uh, related to uh, God and, and one uh, uh, on entertainment, I guess, as things that either supply meaning or take us away from meaning, okay. right? And uh, so um, Michaela Peters, uh, one of our undergraduates, asked, you've alluded slightly to this, but in many ways, the plague reflects a similar existential crisis to the death of God in the mid 20th century as expressed by Nietzsche. In this yeah. case, there was an explosion of thought around the question of being markedly by Marx, Heidegger, etc., which radically changed modern thought and gave rise to postmodern themes. In what way, if any, do you think Thucydides' account of the plague contributed to a pivot in ancient thought? And how do these moments contrast from each other? What does this say about the interaction of philosophy and the question of being? And, and I'm going to just add a little bit on to that, okay? So another student, oh, Adam, asks, raises the question about God and says, you know, look, isn't God just, a, a, and religion in general, just a tool used by the government to prevent citizens from losing hope? Um, and Liz, Lizzie Erlbacher asked the question about um, distracting ourselves with entertainment and technology to not think about the big questions. So, so there's, a, there's a lot there. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, uh, <laughs> Tater's answering for me. That's my cat. Uh, no, no, it's, it's not Eidos, it's Icos. It's a Kappa, not a Delta. His, his Greek sucks. Um, so yeah, I think Michaela, uh, uh, hit pretty much all the deepest questions. Uh, yeah, mid 19th century. Yeah. Um, wow. So... 
I think, sorry, that's still my cat. Uh, so uh, a lot of us, a lot of people in, in my neck of the political theory woods um, see the ancients as confronting these same very questions that, that Nietzsche and Heidegger uh, re-raise. Um, questions of, of being. Uh, there's a similarity, I mean, this is kind of maybe overdone, but uh, you have ancient conventionalism, which is the sophists, so they believe that, you know, there, there's no uh, truth about uh, the, the good or the just or the unjust, it's all conventional, and then you have responses to that. Uh, uh, can we discover a natural ground uh, for me? Um, and the ancients are more hedged on that question uh, than uh, is, is usually believed. Um, but what goes with that uh, more ambivalent or ambiguous position is uh, uh, an openness to the problematic character of addressing any such questions as meaning and being. Um, and There's really, I mean, the problem is there's no way really to, to that I can do more than to, to flag the issue that uh, ultimately the, the, the deepest question is, can we understand anything about, about being and to what extent uh, does, in what ways does the question of being emerge in, for us? Uh, and for the ancients, there are fundamental problems in, in political life. To be a fundamental problem is to be a problem that can't be solved. There's something fundamentally paradoxical about uh, the human, uh, what it means to be a human being. And those paradoxes emerge in, in fundamental political problems. And, and those uh, you know, generate all the debates. Um, and if you take the debate seriously and try to understand them, you are quickly led to higher questions of what it means to be a human being and uh, what, what can be said about nature. Um, there's, uh, I mean, Socratic dialectic is, sort of proceeds by a hierarchy of questions from what's emergent directly in a political circumstance and the, the, the highest questions. All I can do is, is kind of put you on the path and say that the ancients are as alive to these questions as, as the postmoderns, which is why you know, who are the deepest postmodern thinkers? Nietzsche and Heidegger. Where did they, you know, where did they cut their teeth on ancient thought? They're, they're both uh, deeply invested in trying to understand the ancients. And, um, you know, as, as Leo Strauss said, they make it possible f uh, for the first time in a long time to really be open to the original dilemmas um, uh, that the ancients confront confronted that uh, uh, have been obscured um, by, by the solutions that, we, that we've attempted. I'm sorry, uh, that's, I fed you. Tater's insisting on the priority of big questions to deep questions. Okay, well, from Nietzsche to Heidegger, uh, Tom Vaswani, a grad student at Georgetown asks, how does your big question versus deep question map onto and differ from Heidegger's distinction between the ontic and the ontological? Uh, yeah, so um, the ontic would be uh, uh, involved in the big questions. Uh, you know, think of it this way. The ontic, let's put it in Heideggerian terms, um, the, the technological treats the ontic as the ontological. Um, that is to say, the ontic, and this is all very rough because I'm not a, a Heidegger expert, but uh, ontic has to do with what's, what, what's the character of things? What are they like? Um, what's, what's the, uh, uh, you know, the being of beings? Um, uh, and the big question, how do I put food on the table, involves manipulation of nature. Uh, you go out, you work a job, you, you, you till a field, you get food, um, uh, you build a factory, you make stuff. Um, uh, 
the further you go in the direction of, of building factories, the, the, the more manipulated your environment becomes, the more artificial your environment becomes. And so the, the, the character, the way that you're looking at the world uh, uh, loses track of its original beginning point where there's both the ontic and the ontological. The ontological has to do with what's the nature of being? Uh, what does it mean to be something? Um, and that also involves the question of how does the being of something emerge out of non-being? Um, so the deep question has to do with, with, with being. What does it mean to be a human being involves the question, what does it mean to think about these things? What, is it, what does it mean to be the, the, the creature that is alive to the question of the nature of existence? Um, and how does that question emerge for us? Um, that's, that's a deep question. Uh, the question, how to put food on the table, it's an important question. Uh, um, it's, I, I do not mean to diminish it in, in the slightest, but it's, it's a different category. And it's maybe closer to uh, what I understand to be the ontic. But if there's a Heidegger uh, uh, scholar in here who can correct me, I, I'm happy to hear it. I'm, I'm uh, uh, an amateur. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to do a, a few more specific questions uh, about Thucydides, and then there's several questions about other uh, um, uh, problems in our society today. So the first one comes from Parita Goville, an undergraduate. Yay. Thank you for a great lecture. If no fear of God or law of man had enough of a restraining influence on human nature, what can actually place a sufficient restraint on our nature, particularly today? Would you say that as a role of a prudent statesman or instead community to guide individuals toward a human good? Yeah, well, well, both, right? Uh, um, and the difficulty, um, anyway, the difficulty is, is the, you know, the question is, what's the answer? Who, uh, who provides the answer? Uh, every statesman is, is going to uh, either give you an answer uh, uh, that they've come up with, or they're going to forward an answer that, uh, what, you know, helps them. Uh, uh, they're going to, uh, you know, press those answers that seem most plausible, and the plausible tends to be informed by the advantageous. Um, so, uh, and it's, a, it's a great question because, uh, well, so let me, let me, let me take a step back. Um, Thucydides suggests that what restrains us uh, or rather what makes us more given to social cooperation is this combination of protection of the body and threatening the body. Uh, the community needs to, needs to keep us safe uh, and the community needs to be able to punish us. Um, without safety, uh, we're not gonna care about uh, uh, punishment. Without punishment, we're not gonna care about punishment. Uh, uh, and so uh, both of those. When it comes to answering the question of for what, right, safe for what, I mean, you know, I come to this, uh, you know, sort of from the standpoint of what does liberty mean? Uh, those of us who, who think about and care about liberty are faced with this question, what's it for? What's, what, what, we need to give it content. Okay, how, what does that, what does that mean? Well, uh, you know, there are different ways of distributing these, these responsibilities. Um, if, if we want a society in which our statesmen are, are limited in what they can tell us to do and uh, what sort of meanings they can offer us, then we got to take the, the responsibility ourselves. It's up to us. I mean, uh, one of the things that I say when I'm teaching Tocqueville and, and Mill is that for Tocqueville and Mill, Liberty isn't a, a, a principle, it's, it's a practice, it's a way of life. It's something, you have to live liberty, which means you've got to take responsibility. You've got to, you've got to have your own rudder. Um, and okay, if you're going to have your own rudder, I mean, it's either that or you accept somebody else's. Right? Come up with your own answer or you're, you're stuck uh, uh, following somebody else's. And uh, if you don't like the idea of following somebody else's, then you better, you better start thinking about it. All right, we've got two questions now from the uh, foundation think tank world. First one, th these are both uh, specific to Thucydides uh, in some interpretive questions. The first comes from Tom Cleveland of the Jack Miller Center. Hey, great. Uh, and this question is, 
you said that the Athenians believed that they've been given a divine sentence. At 264, Pericles says that, quote, the daimonic things, tied daimonia, must be born by necessity. Yes. Though the word is ambiguous, it seems to be that daimonic here means that the plague is natural, not divine. If that's, yes. if that's correct, does Thucydides agree? If so, how does he decide one way or the other? This is such a great question. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to answer it. Um, but it's so good. One of the things, so the, the plague narrative is set between these two astonishing speeches. There's the funeral oration, uh, which gives this kind of social contract to the Athenians. And uh, then there's the plague. And Pericles manages to resurrect Athens, the, the Athenian community, Athens as a, as a political community, in this one speech, you know, in, in uh, uh, a, a very short time. But the last speech is really astonishing. He starts off by giving kind of a social contract. Well, you got to care about the city. Uh, stop thinking about your own sorrows because if you don't take care of the city, we're all sunk. So the public good serves the private good. Uh, so if you care about your own private good, you got to take care of the public good. And then he starts, he kind of introduces the notion of glory. And then towards the end, he makes a couple of really amazing statements. Um, he treats the daimonic, uh, uh, which is sort of divine scent. It, uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean, um, it means supernatural. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have so strong a meaning as, as divine as in Zeus something, but something supernatural. He says, they must be born as, as necessities, um, the way you would bear uh, the, the hardships of, of battle. That is to say, uh, you have to be indifferent to them. Um, and before he says that, he, he emphasizes that the plague was not something that, that, we, that could be foreseen. And so Pericles' attitude towards uh, the, the supernatural is that you have to ignore it. It's not something that uh, can be gained prudentially. And whatever can't be gained prudentially is, in a certain sense, invisible to statesmanship. Uh, the, the, the statesman can only look at what can be uh, uh, subject to prudent calculation. So it's, he doesn't say the gods don't exist, but the implication is we, we have to ignore them. Uh, all we can do is base our reasoning on, on the concrete and something that he emphasizes over and over and again in, in his speeches. What's concrete? What's manifest? What's, what's here? Um, and uh, is Pericles right? Um, Thucydides, I mean, you know, he, he's, he's open-ended in a very interesting way. He's skeptical of oracles, but that's because he treats the oracles uh, in terms of political psychology. He's like, well, you know, the Athenians took these old statements as if they were prophetic. And, you know, if, if something else had happened to Athens, they would have interpreted these statements differently to, to you know, to suit them. As is expected, uh, the Athenians were casting around for something to, to uh, support some, some kind of divine explanation. Um, uh, and he seems to give uh, a kind of naturalistic explanation, but he leaves the door open. And I think the reason he leaves the door open in, in various ways, and uh, you know, Tom, but I think the reason he leaves the door open is because the question of nature ultimately is, is one that has to be somewhat mysterious. I think he thinks that, that at, at bottom, so, nature is kind of mysterious. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're just at seven o'clock now. We have, we have a lot of other questions in the queue. So if you're willing, if you're willing to stay, well, yeah. let's go on for maybe another 15 minutes, right. um, but, but not beyond that. I'm gonna change the direction. We have uh, at least two questions. There are actually more, but I'm gonna read two questions that have to do with uh, questions of justice in our society today, okay. um, other than COVID-19. Okay. And the first comes from Bob Nardo, who okay. is uh, no, a wow. from 04 and a current charter school director in Memphis. And he writes, 
I wonder if you could speak to any parallels from Athens with the other plague that we've been dealing with, reckoning over justice. What does Thucydides have to teach us about equality in the political community and how, if at all, this may change for good or ill through the demographically cross-cutting impact of the plague? And then I'm gonna read a second question that goes along with that. And this is from our old friend and former colleague, Shanaysha Sauls. Hey. There are any number of big questions we are dealing with today. Race, racism, opening the economy, respected political leadership, ed tech, childcare, et cetera. What are we cave dwellers engaging in? Where are we cave dwellers engaging in the deep questions? Oh, these are so good. And uh, I just want to say how great it is that uh, I've gotten so many terrific questions from, uh, from friends and from, from old students. And in particular, this, the questions from students, uh, uh, I mean, I, I can't really take credit for how good these questions are, but I kind of still want to take credit for how good these questions are. Is, they're, they're so, this is so great. Uh, so Bob's question is terrific. Uh, and Shanaysha's, um, you know, I'm just spitballing. I mean, uh, equality, it's so different. Uh, I mean, equality in the Athenian context. Uh, Pericles says that the great, one of the great things about Athens is that it's open to anybody, it's meritocratic. Um, so anybody can, can rise to leadership no matter what their, their background is. Uh, is that true? Mm, yeah. uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great vision. But it's interesting because it's explicitly about submerging one kind of inequality, namely uh, uh, economic inequality, for the sake of another kind of inequality, which is merit. Uh, and Pericles is explicit that some people are better than others which of course you can do if you're Pericles. <laughs> uh, so it's not, the Athenian project is not uh, uh, egalitarian. Um, it's, it's eudaimonic. Uh, uh, we want to foster human excellence and we have no expectation that excellence is going to be equally distributed, but we're going to be tolerant of that um, as long as everybody's still striving to the extent they can to better themselves uh, in, in, in the way that they can. Now, one thing in the background of this speech is uh, tensions between the rich and the poor. And this is something that I, uh, I mean, I'm not gonna go into it too deeply, but um, in, in the background of this speech, there's this implicit bargain uh, in Athens that uh, the poor uh, Athens is, in, is, is democracy, it's an imperial democracy. Who's most in favor of, of the imperialism? It's not the wealthy. It's actually uh, the poor. Um, they get wages out of this. Uh, a naval empire in particular, you have to pay a lot for, for rowers, and uh, rowing is actually a highly skilled trade. Um, so there's a, a big economic, economic incentive for the lower classes uh, uh, to engage in this imperialism. So the the internal tension of, of the democracy between rich and poor gets kind of vectored outward uh, into, into imperialism. Um, so, and, and Pericles plays on this. He doesn't really give us uh, uh, an answer for, uh, for the things that, that, uh, that royal our, our society. Racism, uh, here's the intersection. Uh, I think, and this isn't going to be particularly adequate. But when I think about, excuse me, the, the question of the noble um, and dignity, uh, people need an opportunity uh, uh, to feel like their dignity is respected. And if they don't, if there aren't pro-social ways that they can be dignified, and uh, uh, you know, show both self-restraint and defiance and tackle challenges and uh, um, engage in uh, uh, their temporal projects of, of merit, um, then that quest for dignity is gonna be turned against a society. And likewise, 
safety, right? Uh, we need, the society needs to guarantee our safety. If we can't, if it, if it seems to be indifferent to our safety. Um, I, I think this is why, uh, you know, the, the George Floyd murder and, and, and the other murders are, are, uh, are so explosive. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, it, it's not because uh, uh, African Americans are being, are being hunted down by the police. It's because those, those murders are emblematic of a much larger and uh, a, much, a much larger problem with a deep, deep history. And it goes to the issue of safety. And uh, uh, you know, to what extent are people going to be able to, to uh, exercise the rights that are the pillars of, of our society? Um, and I'm going to just mention that Crystal Stibel, uh, formerly yeah. one of our students who's now at Bosphorus University, also asked a question about uh, equality. But do you want to uh, take on uh, Shanaysha's question, where, if at all, I'll add, <laughs> is our examples of deep thinking in our society now? Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, Twitter is so discouraging. <laughs> uh, um, that, see, th this, is the, this is the job of a cultural critic, and I'm not really a cultural critic. Uh, so, I, I mean, I have to say, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I know that uh, I know a lot of really deep and really interesting people that I, that I talk to uh, uh, on Twitter and elsewhere um, about these books and, and, and these sorts of questions. Um, but in terms of public intellectuals, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's less my game. I mean, I think... Um, uh, you know, there are public intellectuals that are that are grappling with the question of equality in a way that that uh, I think is really productive of these sorts of discussions. Uh, I I don't agree with with everything Daniel Allen uh, says about uh, uh, the Declaration of the Constitution, but I think her book is wonderful. And I think it's it's um, uh, uh, really we had her we, yeah. uh, at PTI last year and uh, her yeah. discussion of the Declaration of Independence can be found on our website. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a great example of, of making the connection between contemporary events and high philosophic principle and a high philosophic principle that informs our own history. So, um, I mean, that's the kind of thing that I, that I would point to. In terms of politicians, nah, no, I don't really, but I mean, I think that's, that's always the case. I mean, uh, it's, it's quite rare that uh, a politician can, can really speak to these issues in any kind of deep way. You know, I mean, that's, that's what makes Lincoln so amazing. It's like, where did he come from? Okay, a few other questions. Uh, uh, Abe Shulsky at the, hey. from the Hudson Institute asks, yes. Citizy says that doctors and good people who through a sense of honor insisted on visiting their six friends died at a greater rate than other people. What lessons is he actually offering by saying this? That's right. Uh, uh, I mean, that I think is, is part of the picture of the complete indifference of the plague to human evaluation. Uh, the plague doesn't care about piety. Uh, it doesn't care about justice. It doesn't care about the noble. Uh, the noble uh, uh, is undercut. Um, does it tell us anything about uh, uh, what's morally admirable? Um, I think it's meant to raise the following question. Are these people really selfless? Or does selflessness really depend on a kind of deeper, unexamined assumption that my moral goodness will procure uh, some kind of protection. Uh, and, you know, and that doesn't, by the way, that doesn't need to take the form of an explicit piety, that the gods will protect me. So for example, Nicias is an example of a huge screw up uh, who thinks that, that because he's so pious, the gods will save him. And because of that, he's, he's, very, he's very imprudent. But I think there are other places in the history that suggest that even if you don't go that far, uh, there might be certain assumptions that uh, uh, the moral make about 
what necessities they will be subject to um, by virtue of their, uh, uh, their, their nobility. Um, and this isn't meant to just sort of a take, take a cynical view that, ah, they're idiots or, or they're, they're really just fooling themselves. Um, uh, Thucydides has a very light touch when it comes to, to psychology. The psychology, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole range. But I think it's, it's meant to uh, do those two things, to, to raise the issue of the indifference of nature uh, uh, to, to, you know, modes of human evaluation. Um, uh, the persistence of uh, and importance of those uh, uh, modes of evaluation, nevertheless, for how people understand the meaning of, of their lives, and kind of psychology behind those those modes of evaluation. Okay, uh, this is a question from Tom McGarry, I believe, a recent uh, graduate. Yeah, uh, is glory purely a matter of vanity? In your opinion, does glory seeking help bind civilization? Would Thucydides see vanity as natural? and enabled by civilization or a corruption caused by the peace civilization provides? Has the pandemic suspended people's vanity? And if so, will the pandemic help avoid international conflict if war is the ultimate vanity? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot there. I mean, I think vanity is, um, love of glory, uh, It, 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 um, there, there are lots of different ways of, of training this question. Um, uh, one of the ways that Hobbes uh, tries to quash love of glory is by just treating it as vanity, and uh, that's a kind of belittling way of, of treating it, and it also, it, you know, purposely, and he employs a kind of Christian uh, prejudice against, you know, uh, uh, opinion that, that vanity is a bad thing, and that's, that's something he's using rhetorically. Um, uh, if you just think of vanity as uh, value, valuing yourself relative to other people's opinion, then uh, that's a, a very important constituent of all social life. Um, it's the way Thucydides treats it in the archaeology, the, the beginning sections of the book. Um, uh, it's, a, it's kind of constitutive of social the social self-understanding. When we understand ourselves not simply as isolated individuals or, you know, families running around uh, in some kind of chaotic situation, but when we actually understand ourselves as members of a community, that means that our, we understand ourselves in light of how we are, are viewed. Um, and that, I think, is constitutive of, of social life for Thucydides. That's, that's just, uh, you don't really get anywhere uh, uh, without that. Um, uh, Maybe, you know, maybe you can have bands of pirates uh, like we have at the beginning of, of Thucydides, but uh, civilization depends on vanity uh, in, in that respect. But, uh, you know, like every, well, so, this, again, this gets back to the question of whether or not uh, um, Thucydides is right that uh, baked into human nature is uh, a longing for, for transcendence. Um, the, the drive for glory in Thucydides is, is Eros. Uh, some of the things that Eros does in Thucydides gets done by Thomas in, in, in Plato. But uh, for Thucydides, Eros is, is this longing for the infinite. Um, but the infinite doesn't have any form, it's infinite. And so Eros solves this problem by painting the world with, with different objects, different stand-ins uh, for eternity or infinity. Um, and that's what leads to these very, very destructive uh, uh, ambitions because there's, uh, uh, Eros doesn't want the achievable exactly. Uh, it wants whatever is beyond the achievable. And that's what makes it so dangerous. Um, Modernity is a giant project to divert that into other, to, towards other smaller, more manageable um, targets. Uh, commerce, in a way, has become the, the new mode of, of, of glory seeking, and that's much safer. Um, and so, you know, one of the questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. 
Yeah, do you want to just finish that up and we'll take one last question. Oh, yeah, okay. So um, uh, I don't think the problem of vanity has been solved. Uh, does COVID, will, will COVID prevent war? Maybe just because nobody wants to, to be in the barracks and, and die. I mean, it's, it's just practically speaking, uh, it's going to be an obstacle. Is that going to, you know, put a hamper on things on the Chinese-Indian border? Eh, let's hope. All right, so uh, we still have 17 questions in the queue. Yeah. We're not going to have time to, to go through those. So my apologies to those uh, people uh, who I have not yet uh, gotten to. I appreciate the questions. Several of you are friends, um, but I'll encourage you to email Professor Flanagan or me yeah. separately, and, and we can keep the conversation going. So this will be our last question. So Mackenzie, so you should get ready to... Uh, wrap this up. And it is from Martin Sitta of Annapolis, hey. Maryland. And he asks, would you call the demand for personal liberty a pillar of American society? And would the apparent conflict between that demand and health requirements have a parallel to Thucydides? That's so good. Um, I mean, it, it the, uh, it, it just is a, a conflict. It is a pillar for us, uh, uh, but we also want our public officials to, to procure our safety and those are in conflict. And that's, and that's just a conflict. Um, life, uh, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life and liberty are both on the list. <laughs> right, yeah. And, and, right. and this is why these things are only sort of solved by you know, emergency declarations. Well, it's an emergency. Well, okay, does that solve the problem or not? Uh, sort of not really. Um, so that's, that's simply a conflict. Is there a parallel uh, in Thucydides? Uh, I mean, the pillars were, were different. I mean, um, I mean, I suppose there's, there's a conflict between, uh, but it's a conflict that gets solved rather quickly between loyalty to the family and loyalty to the gods and, and loyalty to law and uh, the destruction wrought uh, by the plague. You're, you're gonna flee your family members. Uh, you're too exhausted to propitiate the gods and it doesn't make sense anymore. And the laws is irrelevant. So um, I mean, that, that conflict is, is a, a conflict between the, the, you know, the pillars and the circumstances. Um, it's, uh, less of a conflict between the pillars, the way the conflict between life and liberty is a conflict between the pillars. And in that respect, the latter conflict is, is maybe more interesting. Um, but for the life of me, uh, I can't, I, I'm sure there's something there. I'm sure Martin is seeing something there that I'm, that I'm not seeing. And so Martin, please email me with what you thought the <laughs> parallel uh, would be in Athens. But for some reason, I just can't uh, think of it at the moment. Um, there, there probably is. Okay. Well, I'm going to wrap things up here. I want to thank all of you in the audience for coming today and listening and staying for uh, this uh, hour and 45 minutes. Um, if uh, uh, Please, if you are not already, go to our website, the Political Theory Institute at American University. Go to our website. You can sign up to get on our email list. You can uh, sign up to get on our Twitter list um, and see all of the things that we have coming up um, and, uh, and that we've had many things that we've had in the past. Our next event will be on September 17th, Jonathan Marks of Ursinus College on free speech on campus. But I just want to conclude by bo thanking Borden Flanagan for a very uh, stimulating and, and interesting conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for, to everybody who, who came by and, and watched. It was, it was such a pleasure. Thank you. Good night, everybody.